Hey guys, welcome to the Rift Table Arcade 2014 special, where we've come back from the dead just to talk about some video games, and hopefully stay alive longer than two months. <laughs> Woo! Uh, give it a couple months. Here are your game riffers. I am Fighter Cows. Yourself. I'm 16-bit I'm Jeff. What's happening, Alfalfas? This is Double RPG here. I wonder what an alfalfa is. Besides that show. Yes. Besides that show, the 1990s movie, and the horrible 2000s movie that came out recently. Oh, was that bad? Yep, it was that bad from what I heard. <laughs> Excellent. Well, all uh, right. We're here to talk oh. about all about last year because we figured a good way to start this year is to talk about what happened last year while this year is still pretty new. Okay. Yep, we're, it's still young. 2015, you are still uh, 10 days old. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I mean, 2014, that was a pretty interesting year. Probably one of the most interesting years I've come to witness. Mm -hmm. Before we go into that, I just want to ask you guys, did y'all have a good year? Oh, wait, I just remembered all the crap that happened. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Especially with me at the end of last year. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, if you listeners don't know, we personally had some personal uh, stuff uh -huh. that happened last year. But the non-personal stuff, I mean, I, I went to a, my first con. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we had some good games. We'll talk about that. Matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, before we, we do have our top ten lists, each personal. But before we get to our own personal lists, which we've split up into categories, first we got some of the top news of 2014. And this is all three of us. And which news story do we have first? It's uh, about the founding father of the Magnavox Odyssey passing away. And that person is Ralph Bear, is he not? Yes. A few people don't know. Video games was invented. Here? Yeah. Well, invented for uh, commercial use, like yeah. in homes. Yeah, that's, that's why. That's what I was thinking because I remember there was some games earlier than the Magnavox, but right. Technical but, commercial video uh -huh. game was here. here. Yes. Who would have thought that, you know, someone like Ralph Bear would leave a tremendous legacy when it came to gaming in, uh, you know, in commercial homes and that kind of stuff. Especially when it came to the uh, Magnavox Odyssey, but now it's become what it is today. So nothing, not pixels or sprites or anything, even though we see those in download games, but mostly in high definition in this day and age. Mm-hmm. No, that, but for people who don't remember, uh, talking about, you know, consumer wise, consumer product wise, he was also the creator of the um, memory matching game Simon. Yep. Yeah, that's how that sounded, usually. Yep. You made me think of Bop It for a second. <laughs> Also, be remember Milton Bradley, ironically. Yeah, uh huh. But now Hasbro's got the rights. Huh. Don't they have the rights to everything? That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, <laughs> pretty comes, much. <laughs> when it comes to toys and uh, board games and that kind of stuff. Pretty much. Hasbro, yeah. working on owning your soul next. That's, that's going to be their tagline. Mm hmm. It probably would be. Oh god! So, uh, have any of you ever tried the Magnavox Odyssey? I have seen it. Yes. I never got to actually. So I know they had overlays back then too. Uh -huh. You had to use your imagination for a hockey field. Put an overlay. Yeah. Yeah. And I never got to actually one play it that though. Yeah, it's because if there's one thing that kids tend to forget, even millennials, there's a thing called imagination. And the Magnavox Odyssey was probably the first console to where it actually had a gun controller that actually looked like a rifle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first, I guess you could call it the first light gun, and it actually sort of looked like a real rifle. I think it was that he gutted, wasn't it? Yep. I think, <laughs> I think so, uh-huh. Plastic, plastic's for losers. I'm going to take a real gun, and I'm going <laughs> to modify it. 
It's like I'm going to show you how we do things here in this industry. Yep. Pretty much. So, uh, yeah. I mean, Ralph Bear, we know you're in a better place right now, but we will always remember that the legacy that you held for us and for future generations too when it can't, comes to gaming and we hope that trend of gaming still continues in this day and age. Much respect. Mm. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, so... On to a lighter piece of... Oh, wait, this is bad too. <laughs> yeah, this is the bad The Bioshock too. people, what do they do? Where did you find it? What Shut down uh, Irrational Games. Yes. Um, yes, um, which is sad because Irrational Games is located where myself and uh, Jerry clo- live close, closely live by, which is Boston, Massachusetts. So this kind of impacted us. Mm-hmm. Oh, yep. Um, but the interesting thing is that even though Irrational is no more, um, the head of the studio, Ken Levine, you know, the creator of Bioshock, and also it's originator that was the spiritual originator for the Bioshock series, which was um, System, uh, System Shock. Shock. He took 12, I think it was either 12 or 15 key members from that staff to still work in 2K, and that team is still going to be known as Irrational, I think, but the Irrational that we know is gone. Mm-hmm. And they're pretty much going to be focusing on uh, smaller types of games, like ones for smart devices. Mm-hmm. Well, man. I never did. I never thought that this would be a turn that they would take. But then again, smart. I mean, mobile gaming is actually becoming very, very popular for a newer generation of kids in this day and age. Even though I find that to be kind of scary in a sense. Yeah. But I will say, uh, even though you, the, your last game was Bioshock Infinite, which released in two, 2013, I actually had a chance to try it out. And, well, not all the way through, but most of it. But for what it is, it was actually a good game. Mm-hmm. And, and I actually like the direction that you went for it, the in terms of its visuals and the uh, just the nature of it, pretty much. Yep. So... Whatever, so whatever Irrational Games working on and down the road, I would definitely like to see what their first first project is going to be, and I would like to see those who who are still working at 2K what uh, what next big thing that they're going to work on. Now, obviously, 2K is going to be making more Bioshock games, but either they're going to have the some of those original members from the Bioshock team working on them, or they're just going to have a new studio working on them in general if they want the original members to be working on smaller stuff. But that's that's kind of early to say, but we'll just have to wait and see on that. Yeah, but um, I are we done talking about Irrational? Because something else happened equally worse, too, to a different studio. Uh, yeah. I think well, also in the same month, too. Uh, Did it happen in the... No, I think that happened much later. Hold on, let me check. Yeah, it happened later in 2014. It was like sometime a- after E3. It was like in uh, August or September. They, they closed in July. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh yeah. The, the other company. It was a yeah. It was a couple weeks after. Yeah. Might as well say who they are now. <laughs> yes, that's that that mysterious. I'm so sorry. Studio that we were mentioning just now it was Airtight Games, which is disappointing that they went under because a lot of people don't realize this, but this granted game? they were formed 10 years ago, but they had so much potential because these veterans were originally from a team that created one of my personal favorite original Xbox titles, and that was Crimson Skies High Road to Revenge. Hmm. What has happened to me? But yeah, uh, I can't find the current. Um, I found a Reddit piece that happened a couple months after someone that was a former Airtight Games employee, again, you know, unspecified, said that you know there was a lot going on about sadly what happened about the closing and how how screen royally screwed the developer over. I'll try to find the article 
after the fact and if i do find it i'll uh, i'll ask jerry whoever's doing the description to post it in there so the listeners can read sally to see sally what happened to airtight but um they were a phenomenal studio and a consistent members of fasta studio like i said before developer christmas guys uh will vinton studios they were the guys that um th- that's 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 a crazy thing will vinton i think does were the same guys who uh oh yeah basically they're known now known as lakita you know the guys who made uh, Coraline. Um, Lakita Bosch. in? Yeah, no Lakita mm. LLC. The the animation, <laughs> the animation uh, yeah. studio. I got oh, they yeah, made the I, they I, made they made the Coraline movie and Paranorman. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. And That's former an... developers from Microsoft as well. So yeah, it was mm. it was sad to see this, but. I feel like Warley, like I said before, they royally got screwed over by Screenix, which we will definitely be talking about later in the episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. And uh, let's go back to a bit of uh, somewhat ha- happy news. Speaking of Microsoft, they actually purchased a very prominent indie developer amongst their own ranks. Anybody familiar with a game called Minecraft? Oh, who hasn't? Anybody familiar with the studio called Mojang? Yep. Yep. Well, that one uh, that one company in which uh, Marcus Knox Peterson at, or Pedersen actually worked for in creating one of the most revolutionary indie games of all time, his comp- company Mojang has been purchased by Microsoft. Bro, so that you say? Oh, I can't remember. Like billions of dollars, like a billion or maybe two billion or something. Would you say two billion dollars? Probably, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So uh, Minecraft is now an, ofi- an officially a first party property of Microsoft, and not only that, but uh, the creator of Microsoft, Notch, he actually left Mojang the day after they got bought out. Hmm. Because he said he did not want to, uh, he that uh, greed was not a part of his stigma or whatever. So that's why he wanted to take things back from scratch or whatever with a new studio. He's going that he either opened or is going to be opening soon. Right. So, what are you guys' thoughts on this? I mean, Microsoft purchasing Mojang. They went was, in on that, man. It was bound to happen. <laughs> Well, yeah, seeing how Minecraft was very popular on PC. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I kind of feel, uh, I kind of wonder whether or not if some of the things that people could create within Minecraft, like custom character skins, if, if that's going to be re- removed and where Microsoft is going to be doing that, but they're going to have to charge fees or whatever, like maybe a dollar a skin or something. Hmm. It's possible. Yeah. But we don't know. But yeah, just still, this was a pretty, this was a pretty ambitious move by their part. Now I can understand trying to get more developers that work alongside them, like Rare, how they're owned by Microsoft. But mm. you, you never know. Maybe they have something in the works to where they'll actually produce the first uh, first party exclusive for the company for the Xbox One. But oh, well, definitely, I'll have to see. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, uh, Microsoft, congratulations on your purchase, and Mojang, uh, maybe you will actually bring some good out uh, for the company because they definitely need to get you know some some good, just like with every other company, in order to make them become a successful brand, not only for just games but the gaming industry in general. Mm-hmm. Another Microsoft purchase, eh? Oh yeah! <laughs> oh, here comes the cool train from our original creators to the. Big- Big M. Yep. If you didn't get Gears of War, then what the heck is wrong with you? Uh, but yeah, apparently, yeah, Microsoft purchased uh, the Gears of War IP from Epic Games. I don't know if the I don't know if the, how much it was was disclosed, but yeah, I it was look that up. a pretty. It was a pretty penny of how much it was purchased for. Let's just say that. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. 
because Gears of War was a pretty prominent uh, franchise on the Xbox 360 that actually managed to sell like crazy for both Microsoft and Epic. Yep. And um, the Black Tusk Studio, which was formerly known as Microsoft Studios Vancouver, is now the head of developing the Gears of War franchise with the first new title under their reign coming out for the Xbox One, most likely 2016, so next year. Hmm. Not only that, but uh, it's kind of funny we were talking about Rational beforehand because Rod Ferguson, who was one of the original guys behind the original Gears of War, I think the first one and second one only, he has joined Black Tusk Studios to be the head, you know, the creative director on this game. Mm-hmm. All so I see should happen in January. I'm not. I'm not finding a, uh, a dollar amount here. Yeah. Wait. Nope. Never mind. Never mind. That's, <laughs> I thought I did, but I didn't. <laughs> Go ahead. But yeah, like uh, like I said, Roger Ferguson's uh, who was originally with Epic when they were making, I think either the first or second one. I can't say for the third because I can't remember. But he was there during the days of its infancy, at least. And he came back to Microsoft, and he's working with um, Black Tusk as a full-time employee there to be a sheep, a sheep herder for you know a shepherd for the franchise, basically. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm kind of intrigued to see what we're definitely going to see about the uh, upcoming title for next year at this year's E3. So it's going to be really interesting. Of course. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, that was that was the interesting thing to see from the start of last year. But let's get to a bit more recent. Uh, and something I've been kind of anxious to talk about. The debut of Amiibo by Nintendo. Mm. Or the day everybody freaked out because they can't buy their Metroid figures. Yeah. it ran out or something like that. I know. But go ahead. Give us the details, the facts, uh, Kyle. See, Nintendo, we care about Metroid. Now give us a new one. Well, in January of that year, we heard that Nintendo bought out a uh, a toy factory or a toy studio to work under them to produce their lineup of smart toys to compete against the likes of both uh, the Skylanders franchise and Disney Infinity. Um, of course, Skylanders is owned by Activision, whereas Disney Infinity is owned by Disney Interactive. And uh, But their approach with the Amiibo was actually is actually kind of different because the their first lineup actually is done to coincide with the release of Super Smash Brothers for 3DS and Wii U and um, they've been having waves of the different toys come out within uh, about every month or two but of course with the uh, first wave it came out uh, on the day when Smash Brothers for Wii U released but then the second wave came out in mid-December, and now we have a third wave that's on its way soon, where it's coming out in February. And, uh, yeah, the uh, the toys have actually garnered a lot of positive reception for, you know, being collector's items or to be usable in games outside of Smash Brothers. Like, uh, Nintendo announced that some of those games that are compatible with uh, the Amiibos are Hyrule Warriors, for instance, and even Mario Kart 8, whether or not they give, you know, whether they give extra bonuses, like... For Mario Kart 8, you can get extra costumes for your Amiibos, while in Hyrule Warriors, uh, you can get Link the the spinner item that he could use in Twilight Princess or, you know, as one of the main weapons. Or for other characters, they can actually, um, you or other Amiibos that you can use, they can actually give you different uh, uh, collectible uh, materials that you can use to forge the new abilities and that kind of stuff. So, yeah... The Amiibo, like I said, has been a very prominent uh, success uh, from around the world so far, selling as many copies as the current Smash Brothers right now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's why it's been successful. Not only is a really detailed, you know, peripheral to actually own, but also it's a peripheral unlike the other NFC based um, figurines that you see for either Skylanders and or Disney Infinity, which is only used for one game respectively each. Mm -hmm. Amiibo, on the other hand, can be utilized for any Nintendo property, and there are and there are more others that are coming along the way too. As uh, mm -hmm. you know, other waves 
especially, but also compatibility with other games like the new uh, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse coming out next month where you can actually use the amiibos of Kirby, King DDD, and Mennonite to do all sorts of unique things that uh, regular Kirby cannot do in that game. But even though Amiibo has been very successful, it's been uh, ha- Nintendo's been having a hard time trying to meet uh, meet up with demand for the figurines because not only are there those that are bound to stay for quite a while, but there have been a lot that have been ceasing production after its release period. Yeah. Like, shortly after its release period. And that is very baffling, because you figure with a lot of these Amiibos that they could have been, that they could have met up with demand very quickly. Mm-hmm. And they had all that time to, you know, to work on them, for that matter. And now, a lot of websites that actually do bring about Amiibos to where everybody can pre-order them, uh, they're actually starting to sell out online, and they can't even uh, – they won't even allow pre-orders online. And, and uh, some of them are just – you know, some outlets like Toys R Us, they're actually canceling pre-orders unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. It's like, is it – you know, it kind of makes you wonder, is it really Nintendo's fault, or could it be the – Best Buy canceled some, too. Yeah, yeah. that – uh huh. Best Buy. Could it be Nintendo's fault, or is it possibly also the uh, delivery service or the uh, store distribution uh, uh, fault? You know, I would say all the above. Mm hmm. I was thinking because, the same thing because, like, it's it's like it's like early going back to like the first year of the Wii when it was launched because that was a hard thing to buy on storage shelves. Oh yeah, for like the first year and a half to two years. It, Exactly, yeah. Mm hmm. Jerry, uh, what do you think? Shenanigans on all ends, man. Mm hmm. Uh huh. N- Nintendo is saying that they're, they're, these are set numbers, and then I, I'm pretty sure these stores know that, and they're like. Not, not, not that all the stores people are corrupt, but. Like, I gotta imagine some of them are holding, holding off, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I really hope like, that they... Like, oh, I want to keep this for myself or something. <laughs> for all we yeah. But, but I really hope that they do not... That Nintendo doesn't stop making the figurines because I did hear they did Miyamoto say... say they, they might, so... I, because Miyamoto said that they're, they're... That they could possibly just be making Amiibo cards, which I'm not really in favor oh. of. No, that would be stupid. I, I, they did say the cards, but I think it's like, the reason I want the figures isn't even for the game. Because they're figurines. Yeah, of my mm. favorite characters. Yeah, yeah. They'll collect, and they're they would be collectors items in that sense. I mean, he says this happening too because I feel like that the reason why the Meebles are doing so well is majority because of that. They don't care if it's a game if they keep use their game. They just say like, "Oh, cool! It's a cheap plastic figurine that I can just put on my desk on my desk at work or something like that." You know what I mean? Uh-huh. If they just change it to if they just change it to the Meeple cards, I can tell you one thing: those great sales they're having right now, I wouldn't be surprised if they went down yep. quickly. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I tell you, yeah, very absolutely. But um, what the future of Amiibo holds, we're not sure. But we definitely have a li- about a few weeks left, or a month left before the third wave arrives, which we will be seeing the likes of Sonic, Mega Man, King DDD, Bowser, Sheik, uh, uh, Shulk, uh, Lucario, Rosalina and Luma, Meta Knight, and uh, Ike from Fire Emblem. You know so, with the Sonic fan base alone that the Sonic figurine will be sold out in minutes. Yeah, definitely. Even the Mega Man fan base. Oh god. <laughs> Jeez. That's and I know the ones for Shulk and even Rosalina and Luma, Lucario, and the Meta Knight ones, which are exclusive to their own retailers, are even uh, selling out like crazy. I don't get why they did that. That was stupid. I I don't get why they just sell out so quickly. It's like it's not like they're trying. It's not like that you're trying to wait in line to get a ticket to go to PAX or anything like that. Well, it's like what Jerry said. I feel like, like I, I do firmly believe that every store is corrupt, but I can see them being a couple handful of said stores in the ecosystem that are holding it for themselves. Mm-hmm. If they're holding it for them- themselves, then someone needs to slap a lawsuit on those people. Mm-hmm. Because that's that's not right. 
Okay, so, um, anyway, I think that's enough talk for Amiibo. We got a lot of our, our points across, but let's talk about something that would... Let's talk about a thing that kind of started off positive, but then it just went downhill by the time both games released. <laughs> and I know Jeff's ready to tear a new butthole into this, as well as Jerry, I assume, and I know I am too, but uh, we will talk about Sonic... Boom. The positive impact it had at first when it was debuted to the public in terms of press releases, and then the negative reception it received when both games came out to the public. Mm. No, that, I remember but there was both... defending this game so hard. And then it had to... I would too! <laughs> and then it had to go and make me go, well, I oh. look like a fool now. Guys, yeah. guys, look at the positive thing. Besides the comic from Archie, uh -huh. and besides the phenomenal cartoon, on Cards Network, which the only sad thing is, like, why in the hell would you air it so early in the morning? Like, it's either, like, 8 or 7 in the morning they air it, right? That's too early. Uh-huh. That is too early. Yeah. Excluding those two things, if there's one thing that at least made relevant, Christian Weston Chandler. Are you? I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna subtly bring that in by being funny about saying, Sonic can't have blue arms, alright? <laughs> But yeah, what did he do? <laughs> well, just... He sprayed a GameStop employee with mace and got arrested. After destroying a display in his local GameStop because Sonic has blue arms. Okay, first it was green eyes, now it's blue arms, really? Mm-hmm. Can we your people never be pleased? <laughs> we control the character design. No, you don't. You're just fans. What do you... Actually, I think we can all, all know who to blame for how where Sonic Boom came to be, and it's not because of Big Red Button Entertainment, nor is it because of Sanzaru Games. It's because of Sega. Sega and Sonic Team themselves, too. Yeah. Sonic, because, Sonic, Sega as a whole, I get what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, because it's the developer... Sega themselves, yep. Because the developer, they had a lot of good ideas with how they were going to try to uh, reintroduce Sonic for a whole new generation of gamers and kids, for that matter. Which okay. I think everyone agrees. I think that's what Sonic really and desperately needs is a fresh reboot. Mm hmm. But here's the thing if you guys want to put it in picture how bad Sonic Boom was from the get go, not because of the look or design of the game, just because the internal talks between the head of Big Red Button and Ta Takashi Azuka, who is the head of Sonic Team. Yeah. Imagine those two having a discussion and Takashi Azuka saying on why. Sonic should never wear pants. That was a real thing, people. Yeah! That was a real thing. Uh, uh, pardon my French, but how fucked is this, is this franchise? Hmm? How? Yeah, how much? Say, yeah, and I always say this. Yeah, you say Sonic is not supposed to wear pants, but Amy still wears a dress, you know? That's the funny thing. Pants, no. Extreme sports tape? Definitely. Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> but yeah, like, like, and that's the funny thing, it's just like, I know there's been a lot of people saying that it's so bad at Sonic 06, and I'm one of them too. I think this game is horrendously bad as 06 because of all the glitches and bugs inside this game. It mm -hmm. has the same fate as Sonic 06. It had the potential to be a good game if Sega gave the developer the time. The time, the chance, and the effort. Mm-hmm. I'm not but saying no, this is a Sonic fan. I'm just saying this is a gamer in general, you know what I mean? But no, Sega wanted to get it released by the time when the cartoon came out. Mm -hmm. Which does make sense. I mean, let's face facts. It, it it would sell better if it was as a tie-in to the game rather than saying, like, oh, it's coming out, like, say, half a year or a year later, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It does make sense, but at the same time, if that was the case, it should have been in development longer beforehand than just being unveiled earlier last year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But to the, the topic I was going to hand with, um, yeah, Sonic Boom, like, there was – that was the only thing I'm glad that was bad about it was the game. The rest was good. At least that was the only excruciating thing about that, about, about the franchise in general. Yeah, and, and and the rumors of the max ex, the mass exodus from Big Red Button about the game since uh, about the 
the reception that I got from its E3 build, yeah, that was very scary. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I kind of, in a way, was actually starting to believe that, too, because it's just with the... Uh, it's just with what Sega... You know, just from all the talks that, that Sega had, or Sonic Team had with uh, the companies, uh, Big Red Button, and Senzaro, Senzaro Games, it's like, really, Sega? You really want to, you know... Continue the trend with what other third-party companies are doing with trying to rush their products out the market instead of putting in putting in the quality time and effort to actually make a decent product. Yeah, it's like it's like Sony being stupid in regards to hacked emails saying, "Oh, Man of Steel was such a horrible movie," and the executives agreeing when in fact they released an equally, if not worse, movie in the names of Spider Amazing Spider-Man Two. And no one's they don't have a right to say anything by releasing a horrible product. Is what I'm getting at is. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, and, uh, my stance, and my stance was just changed significantly, significantly about Sega after that happened. But anyway, yeah. uh, Mr. Fighter Kaos, your two cents. Mm-hmm. Uh, still on Sonic? Yeah. Yeah, I heard all that. Was on Sonic? Yeah. Uh, too bad we. Too bad we will never hear from Sammy Classic Sonic fan ever again. Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his rate on Deus Ex. Deus Ex. <laughs> yeah. I, but he, you know he no longer does YouTube videos, right? Uh, apparently he does still, sadly. But under a different... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, oh, okay. Yep. Okay, never mind then. But, but, just it, the, it, but just the infamy was just so outrageous. Oh, no, not only that, but in regards to Sonic, it's only going to get worse because there's been a confirmed uh, mobile game for uh-huh. Sonic Team. Yeah. And there's... You, you, we all know about that upcoming Sonic movie, right? Yep. It's going to be PG-13. So Let Sonic's dead. <laughs> Very much! Um, there you go. And let me Thanks guess. Thanks a lot, Sega! And let me guess, Michael Bay has a hand in it too. Oh God, no, 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 no! no. Oh God! <laughs> no, wait! No. <laughs> okay, let me phrase that. Person of fine, but directed, hell no. <laughs> I think I just broke Jeff's spirit. No, when no, I'm no. Not... Sega broke my spirit years ago after they got off the console division, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> my, my soul was shattered to two to begin with. Okay. It, well, let's go ahead and switch gears now, because I think we talked about Sonic Boom long enough. Yeah. <laughs> if we want to talk about something good about Sega, let's talk about their most recent company purchase. Oh, no, yeah. they're good, but they're unexpected purchase because <laughs> who knew they had this much money? Mm-hmm. And that one company is the creator of the Shin Megami Tensei series in the Persona games, Atlas. And the people that that uh that will uh, import games that nobody else wants to. I know. Yeah, ex- exactly. Like uh, 3D Dot Game Heroes and uh, uh, Dragon's Crown. Yep. yep. I got. I got to tell you to be honest. When we heard the news that Atlas was in route to being purchased by a company, I thought the iMac choice was going to be Nintendo due to the wealth that they had on them as a company, and plus the recent release from Nintendo's side was Shimigami Tensei Four. Mm-hmm. So I always thought it'd be Nintendo, but when I heard it was Sega, it's like. Okay, I did not expect that whatsoever, to be honest. Right. But, you know, seeing how Sega bought out Atlas, and how bad Sega has become now ever since about Sonic Boom, with mm-hmm. how, how bad they treated it, I think Nintendo needs to buy Sega out, so that way they can have both Sega and Atlas under their belt. That would be hilarious. It would be. Because what Sega's doing is not working out properly. But anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, the new Persona 5 that's coming out this year for PS4, it's, mm. going, to, it's going to have uh, Sega's name attached to it. Mm-hmm. 
But it kind of makes me wonder about the fate of Shin Megami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem with Nintendo. I think that's dead, to be honest. Well, we don't know yet. Oh, true, but it's just with how, with how much we news we haven't had, it's 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 a good possibility. I'm trying to get at you know what I mean. It's only been about two years since we heard news, so yeah. But it, I I wouldn't consider it to be dead. It was just only a day. It was just only a debut trailer. Yeah, but, but I'm, just, no I'm just saying respectfully. In two years, things can. Well, change. I know. Well, I know that, but no gameplay was showed. That's the thing. Well, that's where I'm getting at, anyways. Mm-hmm. But, um, but whatever. But definitely, uh, we'll have to see how far this partnership goes on between, or you know, between Sega and Atlas. Now that Sega practically owns them now, mm. or owns most of Index uh, Corporation, that for that matter, which Atlas was a part of. Mm, that's right. Jerry, what do you think? Well. It gives At- it gives Atlas some money, <laughs> and it give and I remember Sega saying something to At- about Atlas uh, being this was uh, like not too long after they purchased them, and I don't know if they meant it or not, but they I remember an article where Sega did say Atlas was free to touch their Do older whatever. IP with their older uh, un- unloved IPs. Uh huh. Which to me, I wish. <laughs> stuff can happen. I don't know if they will, but like, maybe maybe Atlas go. You know that Valkyria Chronicles three game that never came out. You know, uh-huh. <laughs> maybe we can port it for the PS Vita. Uh, no, even or, better. You know, translate Streets of Rage four. Well, yeah. Even, wor- even worse, they just come out, tro- uh, just be really mean to us all and say, "Guess what? We're we're bringing back Hyde Lied." Why? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have more uh, full motion video sequences playing where you're playing as this portly dude just going in a first person view. And oh, you're talking about high. super highlight. Yeah, I'm all for that. No, virtual highlight. Yeah, virtual highlight. That's right. Yeah, but still, I'm up for that. <laughs> no, super highlight was was a much better improvement. Yep. You know, but, it was a complete joke. <laughs> well, I know, but still. <laughs> but, you know, maybe this will even give Atlas a chance to bring back some of those games that only got single entries, maybe to make a new one. You know, to make a new game, for that matter. Mm. Like, uh, uh, for me personally, I've always said this for a long, long time. I would like to see a brand new Thousand Arms game be made by them. Ooh. Or better yet, that game seemed finally seeing a re-release on PSN. Yes, exactly. I mean, hell, we just recently got Sweet Ends One and Two finally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, uh, well, yeah, cause that too. Yeah, and, good point. Yeah. Have Atlas work on the next Shinmu. Oh my God! Don't tear my heart with things I can't have. <laughs> Hey, that that's that's how I feel in regards to not having Streets of Rage four. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but whenever Streets of Rage four happens, it needs to have uh, Yuzo Koshiro as the composer. Yep. All right, uh, Sega. Good luck with Atlas. <laughs> Atlas. Good luck with whatever you're bringing to the table, guys. More power actually, to you. Actually, I think the I think we should says good luck, uh, Atlas. Good luck with Sega. You're gonna need it. Yeah. <laughs> all right so uh let's shift gears to something that actually really surprised us which we will actually t- talk about more in this uh in this uh podcast is the uh is the e3 presentation for nintendo oh yeah Ooh. their their digital event it it actually started out like a month or two before e3 came about where nintendo actually teamed up with mega 64 to make a hype trailer I know. Yeah, because when you think of Nintendo, you obviously think of Mega 64, right? So, so that there was enough to build hype. But by the time when E3 came about with the digital event, we actually got to see a lot of that hype, especially when it came to more to a lot of their sketches being done with the uh, Robot Chicken. Mm-hmm. Or the creators of Robot Chicken. And how... 
Nintendo was kind of poking fun at themselves for some of the things that people clamoring on and on about to them, like some guy actually wanting Mother 3 to actually be re-released for the U.S. market. Or to be or to be released for the U.S. market, I mean. Mm-hmm. And, uh... But, but it's just... The, the, a lot of the stuff that they had on there, uh, which, again, I won't talk about to, too much until we get to the highlight about the 180 but just what they did in general was pretty much just a really big surprise like mm-hmm. it's it just like what all games the... you know <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah they actually they actually showed games and E3 uh they... has been <laughs> usually this year this year what you guys were saying it was the year of the cgi trailer mm-hmm. yeah that's what i'm getting at yeah yeah yep Especially, and they even had the debut of the Amiibos, and especially the uh, the Mii Fighters and Smash Brothers. Mm-hmm. But other than that, they they really headed out of the park with E3. It kind of made made us, he- you know, kind of raise eyebrows and be like, okay, looks like they're actually getting serious finally. Sort of road and hides in the shadows. But other than that, uh, like I said, we'll wait till we talk about it during our the the company that did the 180. With potential spoilers, anybody? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, spoiling things. Sorry, <laughs> it's all right. Oh wait, okay. wait! There probably is someone else, but we're gonna save that for later when we get to that too. Yep. Um. Next up. Uh, wait, did, did Jerry say what he what his thoughts were on that? Uh, I did. I okay, I just want to make sure. I just well, want to. Well, sure. I mean, people want want me to be more clear is that Nintendo showed games and gameplay. Yeah, exactly. Whereas yeah. the other two companies, which I, I mean, I thought they did good, but they there was a lot up. of trailers or teases or non gaming related stuff like comics and TV shows that were all in CGI. Yeah. Yep. And as we get one of them actually brought out Brian Michael Bendis dressed up as the Kingpin. Oh. <laughs> ah, the King Brian. Pin. <laughs> King Brian pin. Yep. Or the Brian pin. Yeah. Okay, um next up. This actually um this is actually kind of a surprise what uh, that was announced last year and uh this was actually kind of in lieu around the time of the announcement of Tekken 7 being in development, but uh, Namco Bandai and the Pokemon Company are actually teaming up to bring their first Pokemon fighting game to the arcade for 2015, and that is called Pokemon Tournament. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's a Pokemon fighting game, but done in the style of Tekken. Mm-hmm. I wonder which Pokemon's gonna get the Electric Wind God Fist. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just to be obscurely, obscurely cute. Obviously, the mascot Pikachu, or Not the, or the infinitely better variant of Pikachu, Raichu, who gets no love. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, Raichu, the better version of the mascot. <laughs> Seriously, it's like he's, he's the evolved form for a reason. Yeah. Exactly. But we do have clarification on some of those characters that are actually going to be playable. I think uh, Ma- Machomp was, uh, or, or Machop, or Machomp Machamp. was actually going to, or Machamp, or whatever his name is, is actually going to be one of the characters, as well as Lucario, the psychic Pokemon. The Goku of Pokemon. Yes, the Goku of Pokemon. Uh-huh. <laughs> But um, what are some of those other characters you like to see be playable? I mean, most likely probably Mewtwo, who's going to be one in Charizard. Oh God, yeah. Well, I want to see. I want to see Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Pro- probably Mankey or Primeape. Oh, they fit definitely. Yeah, I definitely. I'm definitely hoping to see some love for uh, third gen Pokemon being in the game. To be honest, because that generation I still think is one of the most over, most underrated of the Pokemon franchise. Tyranitar would be random to see. Mm-hmm. I, I think it'd be really awesome to see Greninja as a playable character. Greninja's mm. in Smash. Might might as well be in Pokemon, right? <laughs> hey, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, he's actually become one of my favorite characters in the new Smash Brothers. Oh, cool. 
But uh, yeah, I mean, the, and uh, the father of Tekken, Katsuhiro Harada, is actually uh, producing the game or the main director or whatever for Pokémon Tournament. And uh, from what Namco said and the Pokémon Company said, they're actually bringing it to arcade first, arcades first before they bring it to home consoles. But obviously, since you know that Pokémon is pretty much one of Nintendo's uh, lead money makers, it's obviously going to be coming to Nintendo platforms, pretty much. Yeah, but here's the thing. I honestly think with how late it's possibly coming out, because it's coming out... It's, it's just You said this year or next year for arcades? Uh, probably this year for arcades. Okay, so if it's this year's for arcades, I honestly think it's going to be a cross-gen game for both Wii U and whatever Nintendo's making for the next-gen console, to be honest. Possibly. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's got me excited. I mean, I really hmm. would like to try it out. But, you know, since we still have arcades in the U.S., I really hope to see an overseas release for the arcades here in the market. I'm pretty sure that Pokemon fans and fighting fans, like you guys, would be lining up to play that game. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, that's kind of the it for some of the stuff that I actually wanted to introduce. Uh, Jeff, why don't you introduce the last two segments? Oh, yeah. Well, let's first get off something that was equally as big as Sega by an Atlas. How about Oculus VR being bought out by Facebook? That I did not even see. Coming. Right? Think about that. Gaming stuff bought by a social media website because we're going to have VR games? I... Mm-hmm. Not it's what? not only that, but I think it was a bad move on Facebook. Cause Facebook's act on their well, own, well, to be honest. Well, what's the facts besides that? Oh uh, well, first off, um, hold on. Oops. Bought by Mark Zuckerberg. Yep. AKA Young Lex Luthor. Mm-hmm. Or no, that's Jesse Eisenberg. Who played Mark Zuckerberg? Y- yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's yep. the joke. That's the joke. Uh, exactly. That's the joke. Uh huh. <laughs> well, first off, it happened earlier in the year, last year, around March 25th, to be exact, and they bought out Oculus Rift for the VR headset for $2 billion. You heard correctly $2 billion. Thank you, so, Dr. Evil. I have to ask again to both of you guys what what's. What was their plan with the thing anyways? Like, what would they do with it? Yeah. What, 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 what were they going to do with it? Well, it's well originally the idea was just for it to be a gaming-centric platform, but mm-hmm. now it's since it's bought up by Facebook, I think it's going to be more of a multi-media type thing. Are, like are what we, we going to get with... the world, like dot .hack? Is that what they're going for? I imagine. I mean, if you saw... Uh, Earlier this People week, like, with How uh, you Samsung, sword art? Why'd you mention but like with the with, with the Milk VR from from Samsung that was debuted at CES this week, uh huh. Like that's going for a more multimedia thing. Like you use it for gaming, you could use it for movies, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if Facebook went into that range, but I can't see it. I can't see you. I can't see Facebook use it specifically for media. I think it's just going to be yeah. for web you know, applications, honestly. You know what? I, this probably wouldn't be too far fetched, but since they allow videos to be brought into Facebook, or you know, that's something that people can do. I wouldn't be surprised if they did something like a Panorama View type of software, kind of like what Nintendo does with like Wii Street U or whatever, mm. or Panorama U, or you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's possible. Mm-hmm. It is a possible avenue for the company. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but yeah, just purchase alone of two billion i have to ask you guys honestly in regards i can't say for multimedia because i can see its usage for other mediums but just Mm -hmm. for gaming specifically alone do you think it's going to be an important tool for gaming maybe not right at the moment yeah but, but maybe probably within the next 10 or 20 years it is possible more likely because see that's the thing like when we saw years ago, when we were first introduced to Wiimote uh-huh. from Nintendo, we saw the potential to some degree, but at the same time, there were people, rightfully so, that saw it as a gimmick. Right off the bat, I can see how potential virtual reality headsets can be for gaming, 
But at the same time, I just really see it as a gimmick from the various Let's Plays we've seen. Especially from PewDiePie. Well, you know that the Virtual Boy was sort of a gimmick because it didn't really give off virtual reality. Mm hmm. It just gave you headaches. Oh, yeah. And you <laughs> duking from said headaches. Plus, there's only a there's only a select few people that actually like the virtual. Oh boy, uh, Keith Apicary, anybody? Oh yeah. Some Neo Geo, Neo yeah. Geo. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I still have them for my favorites. Oh, yep. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, that was an unexpected, highly unexpected purchase from a company such as Facebook to do. I just. Mm-hmm. I, I just can't. I'm, I'm like with you, uh, Jerry. I just can't see how they can implement such I know, a thing. Exactly. Like v- yeah, VR yeah. in general for their business model. You exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. That's what. I, that's what I'm confounded. Because mm-hmm. I, I, I tell you one for thing. The amount of money put. In. <laughs> I can see Zuckerberg doing this, and it'll be stupid. If they made a Facebook branded video game, video game console specifically yeah, exactly. using Oculus VR, I can tell you one thing. Unlike the Wii, that would bomb. Definitely. Not not just because of support alone, but just imagine if that is the main controller, if they ever went to gaming, imagine how much not only the unit itself would cost. We're not talking like five or six hundred, we're talking about around almost a thousand here, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They must have tracked the categories here. Yeah, it's uh I'm kind of interested to know what Facebook has in mind for Oculus Rift in the future now that they actually bought the peripheral. Oh, yeah. Because I, it's just, I, you really don't picture Facebook going into game development. Kind of like how Amazon bought Double Helix Games later that year, too, or earlier oh, that yeah. year as well. That's true. That's true. So true, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm curious too, but I'm also not terrified, but I'm also... Wary? Yes. Skeptical? Yes. Yes, because I just can't see... I just can't see a VR headset being utilized for something from Facebook, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just, exactly. just branding alone, I could see, but just something yeah, but... specific... Exactly. I'm not. I'm not I, seeing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't. I don't see it either. I really don't. No. But Jeff, what is this? The most recent piece of news as well. As oh last yeah, one. the very most recent. Well, the funny thing is, we start off from most recent, and we're ending with most recent too. Is the recent holiday outage for both PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, and in some cases too, Steam, courtesy of the hacking group Lizard Squad. This has been a big problem since 2011 and still has not stopped. And and the sad thing is, Sony knew about this way back in February. Mm-hmm. And to tie this into the, the, those recent hacks that we've heard that we originally thought was from North Korea, which in fact it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? You want to know how they got those leaks to begin with? How? It was through the main server that uses PlayStation Network. Oh. Ouch. Oh, yeah, but what happened was, just to clarify, Lizard Squad is a anonymous group that likes to do DDoS attacks on anything. It doesn't matter if it's... You know, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Steam, Twitch. Uh, they actually were successfully t- took down uh, MLG. I think it was a week after the incident with PSN XBLA successfully. Ouch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just to clarify, DDoS attack is completely different to that of an actual breach. Yep. A DDoS is just a, a disconnection of a server. And nothing. In other words, you're just losing signal from what, the main what, server. If, if I may, yeah. What they do is, Professor Jerry. No, I'm not an IT professional, but uh, well, what they do is they basically through a botnet, and a botnet is uh, computers that they have, or even or even artificially. The main thing is they send tons of traffic to overload the server. 
Yep. And the thing is, people wondering, like, uh, this, I, I didn't know this, I, I listened to people who do know IT explain this. Uh, one of these people is a IT guy, he, uh, he, he's on another podcast called The PlayStation Nation. Mm-hmm. And he was explaining that the reason why it's so hard to fight, even though it's like even though there's different uh, locations where servers are, the main main point of entry is just the same one place. And it's for for Xbox and for PSN, and that main server is what all you need to do to attack with tons of traffic to shut it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Continue. Sorry. <laughs> No, thank you, thank you for coming in and clarifying more of what was what happened. But that being said, that's what happened, and with what, in oh yeah, some like ways, you said, it, 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 it didn't a... piss me off, but it did annoy me because I couldn't yeah. play my games. Mm-hmm. I had other things to do during that holiday season, so I, it didn't bother me. You know what I mean? If there's one thing I'm glad it did show, is it clarifies more exactly of where that money is really going towards in regards to Sony. I can't say for Microsoft because it did, it did, yes, it was down, but it went up quicker than what PlayStation Network went through. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. But what with Sony went through back in 2011 to now, it really constantly makes you wonder how much they actually did work on the PSN. Hmm. Because I, I can tell you one, one thing. Is it's weird that while PlayStation Network is way better server-wise in regards to PlayStation 4 than PlayStation 3, yeah, we never saw this crap with the PlayStation 3. Mm-mm. Like, the only time we did was that breach back in 2011. That was it. Yeah, and that was... Uh, oh, God, that had to be one of the most horrific experiences in gaming history. Try try American history it was one of the biggest internet breaches in American history. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but um, any final words in this regard, Jerry? Uh, these people, I hope they get, I hope they get legal action taken against them. That's all. I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Well, see, that's the thing that I can see people saying like, "Oh, don't! They're just kids." Here's the thing. They knew what they were doing, so... No. They knew what they were doing. And that's, yeah. all, that's all we have for news. I'll let you guys. Anything? Uh, move on. I can't really think of anything else. No. 